So let's get started. Welcome to today's webinar, Meet the VC SE Moati, with Mighty Capital, presented by Early Growth. My name is Sangeeta George. I'm the Event Marketing Manager with Early Growth and will be your host today. So here are a few housekeeping notes. This webinar will be approximately 60 minutes, including a time for Q&A at the end. You can place your questions in the Q&A panel at any time. This webinar will be recorded and will be sent to all the registrants within, for, within 48 hours of its presentation. You can also find this webinar and the previous recordings on our YouTube channel. The link to it will be sent on the recording email. Here's something about early growth. Before we get started, let me tell you about early growth. At early growth, we've got the entire finance stack covered. What that means to you is really two things. First, you've got a strategic partner in your business. Our CFOs with the years of experience and dozens of startups under the belts helps you see what's coming, good and bad, and take advantage of it. From strategic decisions to fundraising, they've seen it all. Second, our CFOs, senior accountants, and tax advisors take care of all the blocking and tackling related to the day-to-day, month-to-month, and year-to-year of your finances, so you can focus on your business. Both early growth and our CFOs have been around the block a few times. We have helped and served over 5,000 clients coast to coast and around the world. As always, our CFOs have helped our clients raise billions of dollars. We would love to help you and serve you as well. We believe in delivering peace of mind by providing you all one-on-one -on -one solutions for all your needs, requirements, including CFO services HR, accounting, taxes, and insurance. We'd like to protect your profitability by giving a sole point of contact to answer all kinds of questions and strategic dashboards to help understand your business company better. We want to be a partner in growth to help your businesses grow by we working in the back end and you can focus on the growth side of the business. We've also got our promo running, running this year. You must have all started planning your 2020 taxes. You want to get a provider in the place before the end of the year so you can do effective tax planning before the year ends. We have a promo running to help you that right now. Get $500 off for 2022 tax preparation. And also I've got a, a poll to kick us off. So I'm going to launch a poll and you can let us know your responses there. I'll give you a minute uh, to answer the poll questions as well. Okay, I'm seeing some answers flowing in right now. So tell you more about our partners, we have a moderator, Rob, with us. With over 25 years of experience in collaborative-based sales leadership to Fortune 1,000 companies, Rob helps clients success by thoroughly understanding the concepts, values, and decision-making process. He joined Early Growth as a business development manager in February 2022. Before, before, before we proceed, just a reminder, if you have any questions for SE, please put them in the Q&A window and not the chat. So now here to introduce our partners and take over, Rob. Hello, everybody. Welcome. I'm excited to, uh, to uh, engage with SC in a minute. Uh, first, I want to introduce a, a few partners of ours. Um, I'll start off with uh, Gary Kotcher, who's with uh, KNL Gates. I know uh, him and, and his, uh, his associate, Francisco, 
Almeida is, uh, they've been great partners with us. And with that, I'd like to introduce you to Gary. Gary, kind of share a little bit about uh, yourself and, and the firm there. Thanks, Rob. Um, I'm Gary Kotcher and my colleague Francisco Almeida, we're both on the line. Uh, we are partners in our Seattle office. KNL Gates is a global law firm. Uh, Francisco and I both focus on emerging growth venture capital practices uh, and do a lot of work with uh, emerging growth companies. And KNL Gates is, uh, as you said, Rob uh, had a long time relationship with early growth and uh, have had a lot of synergies uh, and uh, mutual benefits for our clients. Yeah. Well, it's welcome and thank you so much for your partnership. Uh, I'd like to also introduce another partner of ours, uh, a longtime partner of ours, uh, Trinet and Mike Brunchen. So, Mike, welcome and let's just share a little bit about uh, Trinet. Rob, thanks for, for having us and, and Trinet today. Yeah, my name is Mike Brunchen. I'm the director of sales for Trinet here in the Pacific Northwest. So we cover uh, the Seattle and Portland market. Uh, if you're not familiar with Trinet, Trinet is a full service HR uh, provider for small to medium business, tech startups. Uh, so we work really well with companies looking to scale uh, and being able to give them back the time to focus on their business. Um, but give them attractive tools that help retain and uh, attract top talent to those businesses. Um, so, yeah, really excited to be here. And again, a uh, great partnership with early growth and, and looking to keep that going. So thanks. Yeah, thanks, Mike. And, you know, I know a little bit about Trinet myself. <laughs> right. <laughs> been there, so it's a great company. Um, and then last but not least, uh, my friend uh, Mike Ariano um, with First Republic Bank. Um, Mike, uh, it's a privilege to have you with us today as a partner. So welcome. Thank you, Rob. And thank you, everyone, for showing up. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're at these days. And happy New Year's. Uh, if, you're, uh, if, you, if you've been in the market, obviously, as an early age startup or as a founder, um, and you're on this call and you're interested, if, if you know and haven't heard or don't know about us, you know, we're out of the Bay Area. We've been around since 1985. We partner with our folks that like Trinet and, and Rob at Early Growth, as well as folks like Gary at KNL Gates to provide uh, our startup foundation, you know, our founders with a, a great amount of support wherever we can, whether it's through our networks or whether it's through our innovators toolkit, where at that point, when you are when you happen to potentially be a client, there's a lot of incentives to, to help you grow and kind of build, build it from the ground up. And so we're here to help support entrepreneurs and, and the folks alike and just are thankful to be here and a part of the uh, opportunity today. So thank you. Thanks, Mike. Um, and, uh, and now I'm going to introduce SC and I'm, I'm going to uh, read a little bit because uh, it's, it's a mouthful, but it's, it's well worth uh, learning a little bit about our, our speaker today, um, our guest speaker. So SC Mawadi is a technology visionary and investor She's the founding managing partner of Mighty Capital, a Silicon Valley uh, venture capital firm. And she serves as president on boards of Products That Count, a global community and platform that engages over 300,000 product managers. She also lectures at the executive programs of Stanford and Columbia universities. Uh, prior, SC was building products that billions of people use at Facebook and Nokia. An award-winning best-selling author, SC frequently gives keynotes on business and technology and has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, the Harvard Business Review, TechCrunch, NPR, and CNBC. SC earned a master's in electrical engineering. She's a Stanford MBA and a, and a Kaufman Fellow. Um, Andrew Chen, general partner at Anderson Horowitz, called SC a genius at making products people love. SC and I have had a chance to, to, to chat a little bit, so it's been great to get to know her. And, and you know, it was a mouthful, but I wanted to read this because I'm, I'm excited to have her and learn from her today. We're going to, I'm going to ask some questions of you, SC, so welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Mike. It's been really fun to get to know you, and uh, thank you for putting together such a great kind of full ecosystem for, for this event and, and having a, a full room today. Looking forward to the conversation. You got it. And, and, and for everybody out there, I'm going to be asking some questions. Um, and, and some of our partners too, um, 
uh, as we get through the, the dialogue here, feel free to ask some questions. I'll, I'll give you some time at the end and then we'll, we'll engage our, our audience as well. So SC, to start out, you know, tell us a little bit about Mighty Ventures and, and how you through Mighty Ventures are delivering your value to, to companies it serves. Yeah, absolutely. So Mighty Capital, we have um, established ourselves as the, the go-to firm for product first companies that are raising a, a series A. What that means is if you're um, uh, already generating some revenue or if you've raised a, a seed round already and you want to get to know us, feel free to reach out to me. I've put my email here in, the, in, my, in my name, sc at mighty.capital. Now, uh, that's uh, just the, the, the positioning, but what it means practically, uh, we um, are a five-year-old firm. And in the last five years, we've had three IPOs, we've had three additional exits, and we've raised three funds. Uh, so we're really active in the ecosystem. We are um, really supporting our companies to be successful. Many of them go public. We don't make a lot of investments. Uh, we've made less than 30 investments in the last five years. And so you can imagine uh, our, our hit rate with three IPOs and other three exits uh, out of 30 is, is, is pretty high. Uh, that means we add a lot of value to our portfolio. That value comes from uh, the platform we have, which is a global product platform that engages over 300,000 product managers. Uh, how that's helpful to, to you as entrepreneurs, it helps you hire product managers. We've placed chief product officer at companies like Canela based in New York and, and more. Uh, it also helps you sell and accelerate your go to market. We've accelerated uh, sales for one of our portfolio companies, Amplitude, who went public last year by more than 30%. Uh, we've opened up new verticals for another one of our portfolio companies, Game On. And we do that by exposing them to that network. And then the last benefit of that platform of 300,000 product managers is uh, accelerating exits and, and acquisitions. One of our portfolio companies, Bit Discovery, got acquired last year by Tenable, a public security company, because in part of some of the relationships we had developed with their chief product officer. So that product ecosystem, it's super valuable to our portfolio companies. And that's how we uh, build our, our reputation by adding value first to our portfolio. Well, that's great. Um, quite, quite a success, like you said, in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a few uh, a fewer opportunities than most. Um, what are the things most business leaders and their teams seek the most advice on? And what are you hearing these days, you know, from business leaders and their team and, and what they need the most uh, from, from what you guys offer? Yeah, for sure. So, you know, what, what CEO wants are, you know, higher uh, sale and then fundraise. So I, I can cover all of these. And I really put that in the context of our current economic climate. We're post pandemic, so we have to reinvent everything. We have to reinvent how we work, right? On the hiring side, we have to reinvent how we sell uh, on, the, on the go to market side. And then with uh, interest rates rising and inflation, we also have to reinvent how to fundraise. That's really what CEOs are asking these days. So when it comes to hiring, some of the best practices and maybe advice that I can give entrepreneurs who are listening to this. Um, what we're hearing from our portfolio companies, they are adopting like flexible uh, work from home, work at the office uh, policies. Many of them uh, do work from the office on an event based basis. They try to organize a lot of get together, a lot of reasons to come to the office, whether it's brainstorming, workshops, um, community events really trying to give people a reason to come back. And let's not make that reason, you know, we have a good meal to share. I mean, it's, it's one of the good reasons, but 
it's about like effective collaboration. So that's one thing. The other thing is on the hiring side, what we see is that because of the changing market dynamic, you know, and the recent layoffs, there's a lot of people who are in transition. Uh, the best candidates will want to be really prepared for interviews with your companies. And so if you have the opportunity to publish a podcast, like an interview between say you and your co-founder or you and your head of sales or you and your lead investor to just describe what's the company culture, what's it like to work day to day at the uh, organization, or even you can interview a customer, say, what's it like to use your product? It will give your candidates great insights into what it's like to work at your company it will increase your chances of attracting uh, some of the best candidates. Nice now on the sales side, oh, I can keep going or I can, I can stop no, no, here. Please, no, please, I'd like to hear those three categories are very important, so please go on. Okay, sure. So on the sales side, it, it's actually the, the most challenging areas for, for most CEOs because post COVID it's like, how do we sell? Where do we find our customers? You know, nobody's reading emails, nobody's like, um, you know, wanting to be on Zoom anymore. So how do we reinvent our go-to-market? We see our portfolio companies be very creative with uh, especially LinkedIn, like how they use LinkedIn and how they try to establish like a real-time direct communication on LinkedIn when they do enterprise sales. And they do that by basically trying to increase real-time uh, personalized touch points on LinkedIn. Uh, the other thing that we see them do is, uh, and I will say proceed with caution on this, is try to implement product-led growth strategies. So product-led growth, it's you know, a very popular buzzword, um, and, and often it's a way to avoid creating a sales force of your own. Now, word of caution is it will only work if you have a product that meets two characteristics. Number one, it needs to be viral. And number two, it needs to be sticky. So why do I say both? Like viral, because if a product will sell itself, it means that it has to have a network effect of some sort. And then why do I say sticky? Because if it has a network effect, it can sell itself. But if it's not sticky, then people won't need it over time. And therefore, they will not need to convert to paid product eventually which you know, for your sales motion is sort of defeating the, the purpose. So the best example, it's, it's a well-known fact is, is Dropbox. Dropbox has a network effect because if I wanna share a file with Mike, Mike has to create a free account on Dropbox and then it's sticky because if Mike wants to keep access, accessing this file, he's gonna like get a file from me, get a, fi a file from Mike, another file from Gary, Actually, there are three mics here. So all the mics are going to share five. And then at some point, there will be enough files in, you know, in the repository that there will be a need to upgrade to a paid product. So if you don't have these two conditions for your product, a built-in network effect and stickiness, then product-led growth is not going to work. And then the other thing that I see CEOs experimenting in our portfolio, um, experimenting with, is uh, usage-based pricing. Usage-based pricing, I also say, great idea, but proceed with caution. And the best example of that is if you think about cloud services like Amazon Web Services, one of the big complaints we hear from um, uh, CFOs and, and CIOs is, hey, I subscribe to cloud services and now my budgets are exploding because the, the pricing is, is based on usage. And so they're implementing all sorts of caps and controls, which, uh, which are slowing down the, the adoption of usage-based um, services. And then on fundraising, my last category, like fundraising best practices. So what's happening in the ecosystem right now is um, because of the market correction in public markets, because of the inflation that's rising, because of the interest rates that are rising, it's very hard for um, investors to understand how to price a company. And that's why you're seeing a lot of hesitation from uh, most venture capitalists to say, this is how much the company is worth. And that hesitation translates into 
hey, I'm not sure I can give you a term sheet right now, or I can give you a term sheet, but you're not going to like the terms because I'm going to put liquidation preferences, I'm going to put warrants, I'm going to put ratchets and stuff like that in the term sheet, which basically decrease the valuation of the company. It's a way to protect investors from a very volatile market. So my advice to you is if you don't have to raise now, if you can operate close to break even, close to profitability, and can wait a little bit until the market stabilizes to raise, you'll be better off because uh, tight terms and, and low valuations are here because of the volatility, not because the fundamentals are changing. Once the volatility subsides, valuations and terms are gonna loosen up as well. If you have to raise now, what we see as companies tend to raise with notes, again, like a debt instrument will avoid having to price, having to take into account all the volatility. So that's another way that you can you know, protect yourself as an entrepreneur. Oh, that's great. That was my long answer. <laughs> Sorry no, about that, Mike. no, this is great, great advice. And uh, it actually leads to my next question. Um, in, in, you know, as a visionary, and you're seeing the economic times we're in, um, and you know, nobody can predict, you know, the length of time this, this, this is going to be, but what what trends do you see um, in the marketplace now, and and maybe what you're going to see here coming up here in 2023 that could be helpful? What what kind of trends are you seeing? Yes, absolutely. So you know, when I look at trends, I tend to go back to my my roots uh, before being an entrepreneur. Uh, sorry, before being an investor, I was an entrepreneur and a product leader. And so I look at like, what are the trends in product and innovation right now? So there's a few things that we're seeing. First of all, we're in or close to or somewhere near a recession. And in times like this, what that means is that every organization is going to look at ROI. Like if I'm going to spend that money, like what's the return on my investments? And so... Um, there's going to be a huge focus on innovation that's going to drive cost reduction, increases in productivity. So if you're building products that, that are in, in these categories, you're in a good position. If not, you may want to think about what is the way your product decreases cost, improves productivity. That's the first thing. It's going to be you know ROI trumps growth. Uh, the second trend when it comes to innovation is innovation always trumps ROI. And what does that mean? Like innovation is, you know, right now we're in tough times, but in six months, things will look very different. So if you cut everything, you, you know, cut the muscles and in six months, things start to grow again, you're not going to be well positioned to take advantage of the growth after the, the storm. So you want to Cut cost, you want to understand that your customers are cutting costs, but you also want to position yourself to be a winner in six months, which means you need to keep innovating and you need to remember that your customers also need to keep innovating. And so it's sort of like you have to do both, right? But, but if you don't do both, then in six months, you'll, you won't be well positioned to, to win when the market recovers. So these are the kind of the two key um, things you want to keep in mind as a, as a CEO for the, for the next few months. In addition to that, what we're also seeing, especially if you're selling to enterprises, is the emergence of the product function as, as a key buyer. Increasingly, chief product officers have budgets to drive digital transformations, to drive like integration of, of IT uh, with business solutions, they were very prevalent during COVID because marketing and sales couldn't be in touch directly face-to-face -face with customers. So digital products were the interface, the market, the channel, the product. So now product organizations are becoming really important in the buying cycle of technology of the products that you're building. And they're a new kind of buyer. They're not you know, uh, very cautious, like an IT buyer who wants everything to be secure and fit in the stack. They're not overly like ROI uh, or, or business minded, like a marketing or a sales buyer. 
they're looking at all the different aspects. They're often thinking about like PL level. And so you need to learn the playbook for selling to that buyer, which is something we you know, obviously would be very happy to help you with. That's something that you want to take into account in your go-to-market. So these are some of the, the trends I'm seeing in, um, in the innovation ecosystem right now. Right. Thank you. And I want to apologize. Um, there was not two Mike Arianos uh, on the call. I had to change my name. I was using Mike's link. So uh, oh. my camera was covering my name. So I had no idea that I had the wrong name up there, but since got it fixed. So so Rob Richardelli is is officially here. There's only two mics on the call. So we got that's that's situ that that situation rectified. I was uh, wondering you, if I got it wrong. I know. Back then. I, know. Like, okay. <laughs> I didn't even notice that till till just a few minutes ago. Uh, so yeah, and those are, those are very incredibly um, important points to to clarify. So thanks for that, SC. Um, when you when you look at uh, at where we're at in this economy, are there are there any any kind of keys of survival? Like companies that are having the challenges, either fundraising obviously is one of them, um, but also challenging you know capitalization of, of all kinds. And, and even possibly in the sales end, what are some of the keys of survival to get through this uh, these tough economic times? Yes, definitely. So, you know, I think of it as uh, what are the key KPIs that any CEO is looking at? You got to increase your revenue, you got to reduce your costs, and you got to improve your productivity. So what are some of the things you can do right now? Yes, you've heard it a million times. You want to operate uh, as close as possible to break even. So I'm not going to repeat the obvious. But to increase revenue, I would recommend, like, consider some of these strategies that I talked about earlier. Are you um, a, a product that would, would benefit from product-led growth? Do you, if, if not, think about, like, your enterprise sales cycle. Like, how can you reinvent it post-COVID using, like, active LinkedIn messaging? selling to the product buyers. So really have a you have a growth mindset towards your, your sales motion. You don't need to completely reinvent it, but you need to tweak it to help you drive revenue. Now, when it comes to reducing costs, I think there's a lot of things you can do there, especially considering that there's a, a, an emergence of low code, no code tools. Every startup needs a ton of engineers to build their products. And it's really hard and it's really expensive to hire engineers. So one of the things that we see a lot of companies do is they take the stuff that's not mission critical and they try to find low code and no code tools to build that stuff for them so that they can focus their engineers on building the stuff that's mission critical and really hard to build. And so look for low code, no code solutions by now, there's quite a few of them. Maybe some of you are building some of them by industry, by stages, by you. Know, it's, it's pretty segmented at this point. And it can really like reduce your cost, especially your R&D cost, which is really important in, in this economy. And then to drive productivity, we're seeing more and more post-pandemic, as we're all trying to reinvent ways of working, we're seeing a lot of like asynchronous productivity tools. And of course, Zoom was like as a kind of a dinosaur early one. Slack is also a bit of an old school one. By now, we see a lot of emerging tools that will help facilitate collaboration. So think about like leveraging some of these tools for your own organization. Now, the other thing you can think about in, you know, in times like this is your customers, they need exactly the same thing. They need to drive revenue, reduce costs, improve productivity. If you're offering solutions like this, you're going to be really helpful to, to these customers. If you have a low code or a no code, it's probably good time for you. If you have a solution that improves asynchronous collaboration, it's also good time for you. So sometimes, you know, recessions and, and difficult market conditions are an opportunity to double down. Another time where it's great to double down is if your customers, if you're serving customers that, that uh, goes through like counter cyclical Cycle. So if you're, for example, selling to energy customers or you're selling to healthcare customers um, during recessions, and especially when energy prices are so high, they tend to do well. So time to be aggressive, time to double down. Like what you read in the news may apply to 
most people, but not all people, and maybe you, it doesn't apply to you. So um, innovating is, is also um, uh, being contrarian sometimes. Well, that's great, great insight. Hey, just uh, talking about efficiency tools, uh, productivity, uh, is there any one tool this past year that you're, you, you'd you like to mention that, that's, that you felt, found very useful or that you've, you or your, your portfolio found useful? Yes, I mean, it, it, we have a, a, a lot of different low-code, no-code solutions in, in our own portfolio. In the you know, FinTech segment, Axern is a great uh, solution. In the energy uh, manufacturing, uh, Journey Apps is a great one. In life science and healthcare, Sorcero and SegMed, these are tools that really help uh, improve productivity and, and reduce costs. Oh, that's great. Um, well, thank you so much for that. Um, at this time, I'd like to invite any of our uh, hosts, uh, uh, Mike and Mike and, and uh, Francisco or Gary, uh, any questions you guys might have for SC, feel free to, 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 to chime in and, and, and ask her any questions you might have. You know, uh, hey, uh, thanks, Rob. Uh, SC, you had, uh, we're talking about you know, really the, and I think I saw a question in here, you know, how is the startup going? What's the landscape look like? You know, uh, thinking about where rates are at, you know, higher for longer, right? And maybe speaking to that, um, why are maybe valuations maybe uh, a little under pressure uh, with some of the portfolio companies when they're trying to raise, you know, obviously from a 409A valuation standpoint? And, and do you see that, I mean, you know, from the Fed, obviously, if we had a crystal ball, uh, we would know when rates may drop, but where do you see and what are you hearing with regards to, you know, rates being higher for longer in that value depression? Yes, absolutely. So um, what I hear a lot from, from founders, or I should say what I heard last year a lot from founders was, um, hey, it doesn't matter that our valuation is high right now, uh, even though for public companies, it's not as high because we're early stage. And so then I draw this curve. I say, okay, so your valuation is like about this right now, but the valuation of public companies is about there. So at some point it's going to have to go down. Right. And when it goes down, the first person to get hurt is the founder. So if you're running a company and you're saying, I don't care about my valuation, even though it's much higher than the valuation of public companies, you're going to get hurt along the way. That's exactly what's happening right now. Now, if you're raising money now and you're relatively early stage, your valuation is probably going to be quite in line with public markets. And right now, public markets are a little bit depressed. So I anticipate that as you're raising valuations, public markets are going to adapt back to like, you know, normalize. And so you're, you're in a good position. But if you raise like slightly later stage in the last year or so, uh, there's probably a little bit of trouble ahead for you. That's great. Thanks for the question, Mike. Anybody else uh, out there, Gary or, or uh, Mike? Francisco? All right. Well, if you guys have any questions, let us know. I'm going to, um, I've got a few questions for you, SC, from, um, from our audience. And audience, if you have any other questions, feel free to, to put them in the chat box. But first question uh, from Charles Young, um, what are the odds that an angel-backed startup Will reach 100 million in revenue as a freestanding company. What are the odds an angel-backed startup will reach 100 million revenue as a freestanding company? Yeah. So uh, let me let me answer with a, with a few stats. As um, at at any point in time, give or take, there are 100,000 venture-backed companies. There are many more companies that reach 100 million than just venture-backed companies. But if you're here, most likely that's the pool of uh, companies you're interested in. Out of that 100,000, there's about 5,000 that will exit. And out of that 5,000, there's about 500 that will go through a public exit, like an IPO or a SPAC or a direct listing. They go in and out of popularity. Um, the 5,000 that will get acquired, out of those 5,000, uh, acquisitions tend to be you know, below 
a hundred million dollars. Uh, like 90 something percent of acquisitions are under hundred million dollars. So that means that you know, out of the 5,000, maybe probably 4,000 of these companies will exit and will have a, you know, a liquidity event before they reach a hundred million in revenue. In fact, before they reach 20 million in revenue. Now the companies like the 500 plus a few very big M&A that will exit um, big, these require a hundred million in revenue or up. A hundred million is typically the, the threshold to go public. So to your question, you know, what are the odds? What are the chances? If you take any sort of venture capital funding, you go from that hundred thousand to, to 500, uh, these are the odds to, to get to a hundred million in revenue approximately. Sounds great. Thank you for that answer. Um, we had a question here. Um, what about raising for a generative AI and are market conditions different because of GPT? And I, I guess I'm, 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 I'm still trying to figure out what that acronym is, GPT. You, most of you yeah, so it. you're asking about AI. I can tell you, you know, AI is, is in and out of being hot. It's always kind of warm, but it's, it, it, sometimes people like are super excited about it. Like it's been in, in the news lately. Uh, with chat GPT, generative AI, and, and sometimes it's it's um, you know not as hard because people say, oh, AI is sort of a pipe dream and so on. So there's um, advances in AI all the time, but it doesn't translate linearly into business outcomes. So technology is kind of progressing at the pace of you know our, of research and innovation, but how that translates into innovative businesses being successful into you know revenue being generated large enterprises adopting ai it, it's not at all linear so over the past year there's been some great technology advances whether that's going to translate into business outcome is to be determined our experience with ai is that it takes a really long time for companies like large companies to adopt ai and the revenue takes a really long time in portfolio companies to materialize. And a lot of time the revenue is still very much service revenue. It's really hard to productize AI. It requires a lot of customization. So is this way like the chat GPT, the generative AI going to you know, be the defining moment for AI? Maybe, but it remains to be seen. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, another question. How are you seeing the diff the varying uh, funding interests um, between certain categories, such as and you can throw AI in there, but ed tech, med tech, prop tech, AR, those kind of things. Are there are there uh, certain um, uh, interests greater in certain of, of those categories? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, the the first thing I'll say is uh, they are generally sectors that, that are more prone to innovation, B2B tech, FinTech, health AI, uh, these, these tend to be very innovative. Web3 is also very innovative. It's incredibly volatile. So right now it's cold. Last year it was cooling. The year before it was super hot. It's very volatile. Uh, they are sectors that are traditionally less prone to innovation, um, and these tend to be um, maybe medical devices, ed tech, things like that. Now, that's the, the generic. And in the generic, you can you know, have all sorts of generalization. You can say market's gonna go up and down and you'll always be right. The question is like the specifics, right? Timing the market, finding the needle in the haystack. And so you know, the generic market conditions Everybody's watching them because everybody's like so obsessed with news. If I have one advice to give you, it's like turn off the news and focus on building your business. There are always people looking to buy. There are always opportunities to make a great deal, always opportunities to innovate, always opportunity to close revenue, always opportunities to invest. And you got to be just hustling for that and sort of tuning off the news a little bit. Oh, it's good. It's very good. Uh, I had a question here on 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 Mighty Capital. Um, you guys uh, have been t uh, tending, uh, kind of trending to focus on 
uh, companies with some revenue. Does uh, Mighty Capital or uh, uh, consider pre-revenue companies? Uh, any specific industries that you would consider pre-revenue companies? That might be most, most likely not, and and this is this is why. Um, even though you know, humbly, right? Even though I've built products for like twelve years, fifteen years, I haven't built products for the past five, seven years, and I'm not. A customer in aerospace or in like education. So the way that I see validation for a product is by seeing if customers want to buy it. Yeah, no, that's great. Great to know. Um, uh, and then here's another question: Is it possible to raise a pre-seed or seed round uh, in this economy for, for uh, no code or LC tools? You, you see that possible? It is. You have to think about like how you define seed and pre-seed. And, and uh, you know, if you come to uh, you know, an investor and say, hey, I have this idea um, and I'd like some money to, to build it, most likely in this environment, unless the person knows you and trusts you, uh, they, they, they won't invest in, uh, in the business because it's not a business yet. It's, a, it's an idea. So you want to think like, do I have an idea or do I have a, a product, right? Do I have something that works that maybe needs some customer validation or do I have an emerging business or do I have a business? If you have an idea, very hard to raise funding. In fact, very hard to raise funding anytime, not just right now. Um, if you have a product beyond an idea, so you found a way to hustle and, and build it, you may find a few angel investors who will be expert in that field and will say, yes, I, I, I can put myself in the shoes of a buyer and I would buy this product and they may invest in you. Most of the time, the terms aren't great though. So if you can continue without their investment, you as a CEO, you might be better off. Then you have like an emerging business, like you have a, maybe a handful of people who have given you money to play with the product. They may be your pilot customers. Then you're really starting to have indications of like, there might be a business here. And that's the point where I would say, if you can wait until that point, that's when you want to go look for investors. If you have to raise money before, it most likely will not be on terms that are favorable to you. But maybe you don't have a choice. No, oh, that's good, good. In fact, that actually leads into a next question. Uh, I think I'll probably be our last question here, but um, uh, this uh, early stage growth company, they have, you know, they're, they're challenged. Um, do they wait to fundraise? Do they slow down? Uh, so, you know, cut back, you know, they're in this kind of in between. They've got some revenue coming in. So revenue's coming in. Um, what's the best opportunity for them um, knowing that the conditions aren't great for, for raise um, currently? Um, so I guess they're kind of in this in-between moment um, and how to navigate uh, uh, waiting to raise, slowing down uh, until they can raise, those kind of things. That's kind of the, the overall question. There's a couple of questions that I tried to combine there. See if you have any insight on that. Yes. So there's different reasons to, to raise money, right? There's one reason, which is we, we, we hit a, a stride. We're, we're selling, we're growing really fast. We need money to kind of keep up with our growth. You might be in that situation, despite whatever conditions the market is in, you might be in that situation. If you're in that situation, go raise money. You'll raise, you'll raise on good terms. And there's always a, it's always a good time to raise when you're in that situation. Then another situation is, you know, we're doing well, but we just need a little bit more money to, to hit that stride. Um, what I would suggest there is go back to your existing investor and tell them that, like, and demonstrate, like, we, we've done great work, but the environment's a little tough. We need a little bit of help to get into, you know, situation number one. And most likely, your existing investors will support you in, in some way, shape, or form. Then the, the you know, third situation is, you know, we're struggling. If only we had more money to experiment with this, that, and the other. What I would say there is that's a slightly more difficult situation to be in. 
And again, I recommend going to your existing investors, but proposing a very, very small raise with a lot of experimentation and a lot of like a very much a hustle approach. Like if we only raise a little bit of money, we will have the proof points we need to get to the next stage, right? So look for proof points. And then there's the last case, which I, I hope none of you are in, which is, um, ah, you know, it's not going the way we want. We're not profitable. We don't really see us get to product market fit. But if we don't raise now, we're going to run out of money. Uh, right now, you know, um, I, I don't know that it's going to be possible for you to raise money in this um, set of circumstances. Those are, those are great. And SC, this has been extremely valuable. And I appreciate uh, you taking the time because I'm also excited uh, folks that didn't make it or uh, couldn't, couldn't register and get on this time event. Uh, we're going to have the recording to be able to share uh, around the world with this this event. So really appreciate the valued uh, uh, dialogue and, and also some of the great questions we've had from the audience. Um, with that, I think I'm going to turn it over back. So Essie, first of all, thank you. And it's great meeting you and thank you for your time. I'm going to turn it back over to Sangeetha to, to help uh, close this out for us. Thanks for having me. I'm assuming Sangeetha is still there. Somewhere. And also thank you to our partners that were that were with us today too. So thank you, partners. Sangeetha, are you there? I guess we're in waiting mode. <laughs> Let me see. So I see that there's a lot of questions in the in the chat and in the Q and A, Rob. And if um, if your questions have not been answered and you want to reach out to me and and continue the discussion, my my email is here. So feel free to reach out. Okay. Looks like we received uh, Sangeetha. Can we hear you? Looks like she's having some audio issues from 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 Calgary. Is there some uh, Calgary weather storms coming through? Um, yeah, we can't hear you, Sangeetha. No, that's a great that's great. There's quite a few questions that I couldn't get to, and so um, we will uh, will definitely feel free to reach out to Essie, and she'll be happy to help you in, in ways that you can. Um, Sangeetha, maybe you can chat in the box. I, I, I can't, we can't hear you. Hey, Rob. Yeah. Real quick, uh, you know, before we end here, I just, you know, being here in the Northwest, obviously from a funding perspective here in the Seattle market, you're seeing a lot of opportunities uh, in here with a lot of private equity VC folks coming into the market, a lot within the life sciences space. And when you look at the fusion battery technology space, those are those are some of the new innovative uh, tools that we're seeing here specifically within the the South Lake Union Northwest region for a lot of the startups and 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 early founders there. What's been really interesting and just really quick, you know, when we get to talk, you know, I get to talk to the people like SC Modi as well as a lot of the founders and startups. My colleague Rick Molina, who's on here uh, as well, you know, we go out in the market and we're hearing people talk about a, a reset and evaluations in regards to their their personal wealth. So a lot of the LPs are, are trying to raise funds and trying to come at it. And so you're still seeing a little bit of hesitation uh, given that their personal wealth has been impacted. So when we talk about going out and raising funds, um, you know, I'm not as experienced as, as all of you and, and as see, and as you heard, entrepreneurship is obviously easy. So, you know, it takes a lot of grit and a lot of, and a lot of, uh, a lot of tenacity, right? but also takes a lot of network and a lot of uh, being in the right place at the right time when you're trying to create those synergistic opportunities. And so, you know, I would say is that um, persistence and consistent persistence is important. Um, but what you're, what you're going to see in the second half of this year is, and as SC mentioned, you know, rates are going to stay higher for longer. Um, but if you have a product and you have that innovation side, uh, it may not matter because of the future five, 10 year ROI return that the investor is looking at. 
Um, in today's world, the valuations are down as, as she noted, but people are still looking for opportunities because there's still innovation that's happening. And when you have the likes of big tech uh, laying off folks, this is where the entrepreneurial spirit starts and gets to uh, gets to uh, reinvigorating the society and maybe the web free platforms start to be built. So there's a lot of stuff going on in the market. And just because rates are high and the appetite may not be there because the valuation has been depressed, there's still a lot of tools and a lot of people looking for the right um, the right application or for the right right founder. And so, um, you know, I would just say and continue to highlight to use your resources and, you know, to reach out to the folks like you or Mike or SC as, as she has so uh, offered up her, her uh, information. And I'm sure you'll get that to, a, you know, our other information for everyone. But use your resources, as you know. Um, and so it's not a matter of meeting one person. It's a matter of meeting 100 people because that one person could help drive your company to where you want to go. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Sangeetha, I'll give you one last shot before we... Uh, before Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. I just faced technical glitch with my Zoom. It just closed down on me all of a sudden when I tried to share my screen. Okay. Um, so here you go. Um, so sorry about that, first of all. And thank you so much, SC and Rob, for you know uh, taking the session with us today. And you can get in touch with us at earlygrowth.com. And connect with us on social media on uh, on our social media platforms. We'll get in touch with you, and you can always reach out to SC and Rob on the LinkedIn profiles, and they'll get in, and you can get amazing insights from them. And we have an upcoming Meet the VC next month as well with Austin Clement from Salson and Co. So see you on February eighth, two thousand twenty-three, at twelve p.m. the same time. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Thank I'm you, so everybody. Sorry about that. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Take care.